liquid flax that have bilateral um, symmetry. And below is another flower that has radial symmetry that's called polaric in this panel, caloric in this panel. Um, these, in fact, um, uh, are the same species, but the um, lower um, panel shows a mutant with radial symmetry. But the mutant, again, has identical DNA sequence to wild type, and the only difference is the expression of a gene, which is silenced by DNA methylation. Um, this, these, these flowers were so different that Carl Linnaeus himself originally classified these as uh, different species. So uh, epialleles like this um, are frequently found in plants, um, but are relatively um, un unstable. Um, they don't have uh, as good a segregation as a DNA mutation. Um, so that raises the general question of can an epigenetic mark mediate the evolution of traits? And of course, to have, an ev have evolution, uh, according to Darwin, uh, you have to have inheritance of some type of information, random variation, and then natural selection to uh, seek out the winners, select out the winners from that. So the outline of the talk is uh, shown here. Uh, first, I'm going to give you some quick background on DNA methylation in mammalian cells and mammals. Uh, introduction to our model system, which is a yeast called Cryptococcus neoformans. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, the basic features of the C. neoformans DNA methylation system, and this is basically going to be uh, a little bit boring, but a lot of background, but uh, important for the rest of the talk. And then uh, talk about a paradox, um, an evolutionary surprise, a hypothesis, and then data supporting uh, this um, hypothesis. So that's the overall roadmap of this uh, talk. So uh, when I talk about DNA methylation, I'm talking about 5-methylcytosine, which is shown here. This base is actually the majority of cytosine in the human genome. 70% of your DNA has a C in it. Um, it was proposed, uh, or methyl C in it, it was proposed um, many uh, years ago, in the mid 70s, by Holiday and Pew and also Arthur Riggs, that DNA methylation in symmetric sequence contexts might uh, uh, explain development. And the proposal was uh, shown here. Um, the proposal was that there would be a de novo DNA methyl transferase that could modify unmethylated DNA. And this uh, uh, enzyme, once, um, once it left, um, would result in DNA methylation that was slowly diluted by DNA replication. Um, but if you um, had um, the additional presence of a so-called maintenance enzyme that could take hemimethylated DNA produced by DNA replication and remethylate the new strand so that both strands were methylated, again, in a palindromic uh, sequence co uh, context, such as CPG, then uh, the maintenance enzyme could remember the prior action of the de novo enzyme. So this was a, a, a proposal for a molecular mechanism system that would uh, explain the stability of cell types. Um, now, it turns out that's probably not how developmental gene regulation works in general. Development is programmed by transcription factors and feedback loops. Um, but CPG methylation does play a very important role. It's essential for mammalian development. About half of uh, our genomes is transposon derived, and it's very important to uh, silence these repetitive uh, elements. Uh, so that's a key function of DNA methylation, which is repeat silencing. It also plays a role in chromosome segregation that's relatively poorly understood. And uh, uh, DNA methylation plays a critical role in monoallelic gene expression, for example, the uh, uh, maintenance of silencing on the inactive X chromosome in human females. Uh, and finally, there's um, a, a large body of evidence uh, indicating a role for changes in DNA methylation in human cancers. So despite the fact that DNA methylation doesn't uh, necessarily uh, explain developmental uh, gene regulation, the two enzyme paradigm has really held up well in vertebrates. Uh, DNMT3 is the de novo enzyme, uh, and DNMT1 is the uh, maintenance enzyme. It's actually more complicated than that. There's DNMT3A and 3B, uh, and these act uh, as heterotetramers with a pseudoenzyme called DNMT3L. Uh, uh, and that's uh, shown here in this uh, uh, figure out of a review article. Um, there's a couple known targeting mechanisms. So DNMT3A um, uh, and 3B have, as you can see, these ADD domains. And these recognize the unmethylated form of the histone H3 tail. And that plays uh, a key role in uh, triggering DNA methylation on, on regions of chromatin that uh, lack H3K9 methylation, which is, of course, a mark associated with active transcription. Uh, and in, uh, in the mouse uh, male germline, it's, uh, there's good genetic evidence that pyranase um, act uh, to promote DNA methylation. 
uh, although the detailed mechanisms are unclear because of the challenges of doing biochemistry uh, in that particular tissue. The maintenance enzyme is called DNMT1. It's shown here. Um, it's been studied uh, in, in a great detail um, and um, shown here as a crystal structure from uh, I think Dinshaw Patel's lab. Um, it functions not by itself, but with a cofactor called UHRF1. Uh, UHRF1 binds hemimethylated DNA and um, methylated uh, chromatin. So it has an SRA domain shown here that recognizes specifically hemimethylated DNA, as you can see in this crystal structure. And also has tandem tutor domains uh, that uh, recognize um, uh, histone uh, H3 lysine 9 methylated uh, tails. Uh, UHRF1 is uh, expressed in, overexpressed in many tumors and is an oncogene. Um, it also has a ubiquitin ligase activity for histone H3. Uh, so uh, the DNMT1 is recruited not as shown here by the direct interaction by UHRF1, but by binding the ubiquitin put on H the H3 tails by UHRF1. Uh, so UHRF1 recognizes hemimethylated DNA, promotes the recruitment of DNMT1, and DNMT1 on top of that um, has uh, about a 30-fold uh, specificity for hemimethylated DNA over unmethylated DNA. And again, H3K9 methylation is a, uh, a signal here. So uh, most of our understanding of 5-methylcytosine and its regulation in eukaryotes comes from a handful of species. Uh, mammals I've already discussed, uh, and there's been a tremendous amount of work over the years done in uh, plants, particularly Arabidopsis, uh, by uh, many labs, including uh, Steve uh, Jacobson uh, here on the West Coast. Um, and then in fungi, um, there's been work done in uh, bread mold, Neurospora crassi, by, by Eric Selker since the 1980s, who's made many important contributions. Um, he was, in fact, the first to show that H3K9 methylation uh, can be required for um, CPG uh, methylation. And that was, uh, I think, first uh, demonstrated in Neurospora. Um, so what you'd really like, if you're a simple-minded yeast geneticist as I am, is a, a simple model organism for investigating a process. And so uh, for gene silencing mechanisms, uh, Cerevisiae, which is uh, an organism I, near and dear to my heart, um, has ancestrally lost a number of gene silencing mechanisms, including DNA methylation, RNAi, uh, HP1-dependent silencing, polycomb-dependent silencing, and lysine-4, uh, lysine-20 methylation on the H4 uh, molecule. Uh, Pombe has uh, three out of these uh, five silencing system, but the organism I want to tell you about today, a, a yeast system, uh, has um, all of these gene silencing um, mechanisms intact. So what is uh, C. neoformans? The C. neoformans stands for cryptococcus neoformans, which is a budding yeast that's diverged from model yeast by about 600 million years. So uh, on this uh, a phylogenetic uh, tree, of uh, fungal evolution are shown a number of groups. Uh, some of the, the major uh, phyla are the ascomycota and the basidiomycota. Uh, the ascomycota include uh, all the, most of the organisms you've probably heard of if you've heard of any fungi, uh, including the model organisms, uh, S. cerevisiae and S. pombe. Um, over in the basidi basidiomycota, the subphylum, the agaricomycotina, includes all the mushrooms. Uh, so every mushroom you've ever eaten uh, is part of this subphylum and Cryptococcus neoformans, which is not a mushroom, it's a budding yeast as shown here, um, is part of that um, group. Uh, it's an encapsulated uh, budding yeast as shown here. Uh, it can secrete under the right conditions the polysaccharide uh, capsule, which is one of the things that makes it uh, a bit unusual. The other thing that makes it unusual is that it's an important human pathogen. In fact, it's the most common cause of fungal meningitis uh, in, in humans. Uh, we all inhale it from the environment, uh, but we clear the infection if you have T cells. But if you lack T cells, um, uh, uh, the organism uh, can grow within macrophages. It can translocate into the bloodstream, disseminate, uh, and even cross the blood-brain barrier to cause a chronic meningoencephalitis, which is um, uh, uniformly lethal if, if untreated. Even with treatment, mortality is around 20 or 30 percent because of the, in, in part because of the lack of uh, good antifungals. Uh, as, a, as a result of uh, this, um, in individuals who are immunocompromised, again, lacking T cells, um, it's a major uh, cause of death. So currently, uh, cryptococcus causes about 15% of HIV-associated mortality, which is 181,000 or estimated to be 181,000 deaths a year. Uh, 
Uh, much of this is concentrated in uh, uh, southern parts um, of Africa, but it's actually common uh, all over the world where there, wherever there are uh, HIV cases, uh, including the United States. Okay, so uh, back to, um, so, so this organism, in addition to being um, an important um, organism, is also a tractable uh, organism. It's a haploid yeast that has a uh, complete sexual cycle, good homologous recombination, and it's easy to grow in the lab. We basically treat it like cerevisiae in terms of uh, how we grow it. Um, as a result, we've been able to um, more or less accidentally exploit it to um, identify um, a number of interesting, uh, to, to drive a number of interesting projects, ranging from uh, RNAi-guided genome defense, uh, chromatin biology, which we'll talk about more today, it has a polycomb system, We've developed a chemical genetic map of this organism. We've identified a quorum sensing system in which a peptide accumulates extracellularly and then it's imported to drive gene expression. Uh, and we've taken advantage of the fact that it's extremely intron rich, has 40,000 introns uh, and has uh, makes good extracts actually uh, to develop a tool for profiling uh, spliceosome. So it's been sort of a jack of all trades uh, for us over the years. Uh, and of course we're using it um, uh, in a pretty intensive way to study host pathogen um, interactions. So back to DNA methylation. So the cryptococcus genome uh, encodes a single cytosine DNA methyltransferase homolog. These are easy to identify by sequence. This single uh, homolog is encoded by a gene, which because of yeast nomenclature, we call the DMT5 gene. So DNMT5 is the name of this enzyme. Um, and uh, the um, DNA methyltransferase domain is labeled DNM, DMT here. It's a relatively small part of the protein, actually. Uh, the rest of the protein uh, includes a N-terminal chromodomain, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, a ring finger, it actually has two ring fingers, um, and a switch sniff ATPase. Um, uh, as shown here, that's uh, probably most similar to yeast RAD5. Um, so, uh, Cryptococcus does have cytosine uh, methylation. It's concentrated at the centromere. So shown here is a uh, cytosine DNA methylation tract from bisulfite sequencing. Um, this is chromosome 10. And what you can see is a big pile of uh, uh, CG methylation uh, at one point in the middle of the chromosome. And that um, turns out to be the centromere. This is true of all chromosomes. There's also a little bit in the, uh, the, the subtelomeric regions of, of chromosomes. Uh, if you, and if you knock out the gene, you lose all cytosine methylation globally. And again, it's the only cytosine methyltransferase encoded by the genome. The function of 5-methyl-C um, is uh, almost certainly uh, transposon silencing. So shown on the left um, is a map of transposable elements at centromeres in Cryptococcus neoformans. There are six families called TCN1 through 6. And these are um, all retrotransposons of the gypsy or copia families. Uh, that are uh, phylogenetically distinct. They've been around for a while and they're easily identified. Um, and they're found at the centromeres. And the centromeres are basically just these transposable element sequences, uh, either active transposons or more commonly transposon remnants where the transposons have degenerated over time. Uh, and of course, Cryptococcus has both 5-methylcytosine, which is involved in silencing these elements, but also RNAi, which acts in parallel to silence these elements. In the uh, sister species called Cryptococcus deuterogatii, all the transposable elements have uh, degenerated. And we think this is probably just a chance event. Um, if you have good enough gene silencing mechanisms, transposons will degenerate over time. Uh, and uh, as a result, this organism has smaller centromeres and no active transposons as far as we can tell from sequence. And it's, uh, this lineage has also uh, lost both 5-methylcytosine and um, RNAi. So the RNAi machinery is muta mutated. There are no small RNAs from this, or this organism, and there's no DNA methylation, and DNMT5 is again uh, mutated and, and non-functional. So the first uh, part of the seminar, I want to just talk about how 5-methylcytosine is targeted to centromeres and telomeres. Um, uh, a clue comes from uh, our prior studies where we examined the landscape of both H3K27 methylation, trimethylation, and H3K9 uh, methylation uh, by uh, CHIP-seq a few years ago. What you can see uh, on the bottom three tracks um, is the pattern of H3K9 methylation in either wild type, which as you can see is focused on the middle of the chromosome, it's chromosome 13, uh, 
uh, and you can see a um, uh, big pile of H3K9 methylation there. It doesn't require PRC2, naturally, um, but if you get rid of the uh, homolog of the SUVAR proteins, SUVAR39, uh, one and two proteins from mammals, which we call CLAR4 as an homage to S. Pombe, uh, you can see that you lose um, H3K9 uh, methylation. But the, the important thing is that it's at centromeres and in subtelomeric regions exactly where you see DNA methylation. And as I mentioned before, DNMT5 has a chromodomain at its end terminus. Uh, so we thought initially that, well, perhaps the chromodomain recognizes H3K9, methylated uh, histone tails, uh, DNA methyl transferase, uh, modifies the base and uh, the switch sniff ATPase we thought must be involved in chromatin remodeling. Uh, so um, our initial, the conclusions of our initial studies are shown here and that is that DNMT5 uh, is um, recruited by H3K9 methylation that CLAR4, the methyl transferase is upstream of everything. It promotes H3K9 methylation um, and that's read redundantly by the chromodomain of DNMT5 but also HP1 uh, in cryptococcus. So cryptococcus has a single HP1 uh, uh, homologue uh, that again, as an homage to Pombe, we named SWI6. Uh, DNMT5 does the methylation. And then uh, I'm, what I'm also gonna tell you is that there's a UHRF1 uh, 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 orthologue in cryptococcus neoformans that also functions in this process, again, acting in parallel to uh, DNMT5's chromodomain and HP1. So our favorite assay is shown here. It's a southern blot. Uh, on the bottom panel of the southern blot, um, you can see we're using a probe called probe U for unique. And on the upper panel, probe R for repetitive. Um, on the left is a map of uh, a region of DNA. In wild type, the uh, uh, colored in, uh, filled in uh, lollipops indicated methylated sites for a particular restriction enzyme that's methylation sensitive and the open lollipops indicate um, unmethylated sites based on bisulfite sequencing. So we designed a probe that in wild type, uh, using this uh, restriction enzyme, which again is methylation sensitive, produces a 3.5 kb band, which you can see in the bottom panel in the first lane. And then in the uh, DNMT5 knockout, all the lollipops become opened up, and you can see that uh, uh, the expected band is 1.5 KB in size, and if you look at the second lane, you can see that that is, um, in fact, what we see by southern blotting. On the top is a repetitive probe that lights up a whole bunch of bands in wild type, but you can see that in the DNMT5 um, uh, knockout, um, the bands uh, collapse to a lower molecular weight pattern, uh, indicative of uh, sites being uh, cuttable that are nearer to the probe. And in the third lane, you can see that if you get rid of H3K9 methylation, we see a partial phenotype where we uh, lose a lot of DNA methylation, but it doesn't go away completely either using the uh, unique probe or the uh, repetitive um, probe. Okay, so um, first question was whether the chromodomain of DNMD5 recognizes the H3K9 methyl mark. And so we're able to express as an MBP fusion the first 150 amino acids of DNMD5, bind it to um, 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 uh, histone peptide arrays and found that indeed bound H3K9 uh, methylated, di and trimethylated uh, peptides. Uh, we did fluorescence anisotropy on peptides to um, get uh, KDs. What's shown here is a competition assay where we're binding to a labeled uh, peptide and then competing with either unmethylated mono, di, or trimethylated peptides. Uh, uh, and getting uh, KDs. And you can see that, for example, for trimethylated H3K9 methylated peptides, the KD is uh, 1.5 uh, micromolar. Um, we then uh, mutated the chromodomain of the NMT5 um, by mutating the classic aromatic cage residues. There's an alignment shown on top. On the bottom left is uh, showing that by fluorescence anisotropy, if you mutate a couple aromatic cage residues, you lose binding. And then the southern blot on the right, what you can see if you look at the last lane, is that the mutant actually doesn't have much of an effect when we knock it into the endogenous gene by homologous recombination. Um, you can see that the pattern is, uh, you know, not too different from, from wild type, to put it mildly. So that led us to think that maybe there would be another reader involved. And of course, HP1 is the obvious one. Uh, we were able to uh, express HP1 in bacteria and show again that it binds uh, H3K9 methylated peptides on a peptide array, and we're able to get a KD, a uh, little weaker this time, 
uh, for uh, H3K9 methylated um, peptides as shown on the right in this fluorescence anisotropy competition assay. Um, and then again, we can uh, knock out HP1. And as you can see, again, uh, really no phenotype. But then uh, when we combine it with the mutation in DNMT5, we see a considerably stronger phenotype uh, pre, you know, that's, that's basically identical to that of uh, getting rid of H3K9 uh, methylation uh, completely. Uh, finally, we um, identified a UHRF1 homolog in the genome. It's just the SRA domain, which is predicted to recognize hemimethylated DNA. Um, we were able to again express this in bacteria and show that by uh, mobility shift assays, it binds uh, oligonucleotides um, by, that are hemimethylated, um, but not uh, very well to either fully methylated or unmethylated um, um, oligos. When we uh, knock it out, again, a partial phenotype, uh, and then when we combine it with, uh, so that's the fourth lane, the UHF1, that's the name of the knockout, um, and this is again cellular blotting with again the repetitive or unique probe. And you can see in the next to last lane, not much of a phenotype. If you combine it with CLAR4, if you look carefully, you can see that it uh, makes the CLAR4 phenotype a little uh, stronger. Um, and if you don't like southern blotting, we can do bisulfite sequencing, uh, which is, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, a method for uh, using short read uh, sequencing, um, identifying sites of um, DNA methylation uh, by converting um, uh, by, by the fact that methylated C is resistant to um, um, deamination. Um, and uh, again, DNMT5 knockout in the second uh, um, track, um, you lose all methylation. This is chromosome 13. Again, uh, CLAR4, you lose some of it. Uh, UHRF1, there's really barely a phenotype. Um, and then if you make the double with CLAR4, it's, it's stronger, but it's not completely gone. So that again leads to this uh, basic model that uh, H3K9 methylation is upstream of DNA uh, methylation and is read by two readers and it's promoted by UHRF1. So the, the question is, is DNMT5 a maintenance enzyme, a de novo enzyme, or both? And the paradigm in fungi is Neurospora crassa, where DIM2 characterized by Eric Selker is a K9 methylated directed DNMT that's responsible for far, all five methyl C in Neurospora. And it appears to be a pure de novo enzyme uh, in vivo. Uh, uh, it's never been pur purified as such, but it, uh, the, the genetics argue for this. So uh, we did uh, basically similar experiments in Cryptococcus. Uh, here's one example of such an experiment where we knock into the promoter of DNMT5, a different promoter, the GAL promoter, which as in yeast can be regulated by galactose. And we did it first under conditions where DNMT5 would be off or repressed. That's what the R indicates. Uh, and uh, took, took some samples out and did southern blotting. And then we added galactose to turn on DNMT5 to induce it. And that's what the I20 and I45 lanes indicate in the southern blot on the right. That's an induction of DNMT5 for 20 or 45 generations. And what you can see is that uh, when you repress the gene, you lose DNA methylation if you wait long enough. And in the last two lanes, if you turn the gene back on, and you can see it's a very strong promoter, we flag tagged it. There's tons of protein being made, but we don't see any restoration of DNA methylation. Now you might say that, well, perhaps your allele is not active. So we knocked it in under conditions where it's expressed from the get-go. So uh, that's the third lane. And you can see that under these inducing conditions, overexpressed flag tag gal DNMT5 works just fine. Tracks look just like wild type. If you uh, repress the gene, uh, you lose methylation. And then if you turn it on this time for 40 or 90 generations, um, it just doesn't come back. So you might say, well, it's flag tag, it's overexpressed, sure it's functional, but maybe it doesn't establish well. So then we did this experiment, which is to knock out the catalytic region of the protein with the G418 resistance marker, and then uh, restore that region with a different marker. Uh, so we call this um, RI DNMT5. So RI here doesn't stand for Rhode Island, it stands for uh, reintroduce DNMT5. And if you can look again on the panel on the right, you can see that uh, DNMT5 uh, reintroduced DNMT5 while again expressed. Uh, this again was flag tagged. Um, uh, methylation does not return. Um, if we look at the reintroduced strain by bisulfite sequencing, as you can see on the third track here, for chromosome 13, we don't see any restoration of DNA methylation. If we look genome wide, as shown on the panel on the top right, 
uh, very carefully, uh, we can see an occasional de novo site. So those are two independent reintroduced um, strains and the twos there uh, uh, show that there's actually a couple sites where we see extremely rare de novo events. And I'll, I'll get back to that later. We also did, uh, because a reviewer asked for it, uh, edamol sensitivity uh, mass spec. Uh, this was done with uh, Petra Ajkova in London. Uh, and uh, she quantified uh, by uh, uh, mass spec the percentage of 5MC, um, and uh, shown here, 0.334%. Um, if you knock out DNMT5, you see nothing. Uh, and if you reintroduce DNMT5, make the DNA look, uh, Petra saw a tiny bit, but it was below their um, quantification limits. So you don't know how much is there. Um, and so we think that that may be entirely consistent with what we uh, saw here. And again, we'll get back to this in a moment. The reintroduced DNMT5 still localizes to centromeres. It chips really well. Um, and uh, you can see that um, uh, putting it back, it, it still chips, it's a little less. There's a little, as I'll, uh, I won't show you, but it's, it's, uh, it is the case that there's a bit less H3K9 methylation at centromeres, but there's plenty there it's sitting on chromatin and it's not doing anything. Uh, we can show that this reintroduced allele is functional by doing a genetic cross. So shown diagrammed uh, here are two yeast cells on the left is a wild type cell, wild type for DNMT5, where we've marked a centromere with a Norcia thrysin resistance gene. And on the right is the reintroduced DNMT5, which as I mentioned, basically doesn't have any DNA methylation anywhere, uh, not at the centromere. Uh, and, then, uh, um, and then we cross the two. And we asked on the bottom, we do southern blots on progeny that contain the reintroduced DNMT5 allele but the centromere that came from the wild type strain. So that centromere that's marked here, that Sen3 nat, started out methylated in the wild type strain as shown in the third lane of the southern blot, uh, or actually in the, the second lane of the southern blot. Um, and um, the progeny, it's not the prettiest southern blot, you can see all have um, the wild type band. That is to say they're reintroduced in MP5 when brought together with the uh, methylated Centromere uh, keeps it methylated just fine. So it's a perfectly functional allele. In uh, many systems, uh, de novo methylation is developmentally regulated. So we asked whether uh, during meiosis, perhaps, methylation might be established. So um, shown, you can ignore the panel on the left, it's just a control. Uh, on the right, um, we're, uh, it's a cross between uh, a wild type strain and a strain in which DNMT5 is knocked out, and now we've marked the centromere in that strain. So that centromere is unmethylated. And then we ask, what happens if we bring that unmethylated centromere uh, that's marked with uh, Norcia thrysin resistance together with the wild type DNMT5 gene? Does it suddenly now become methylated? And on the southern blot in the bottom, uh, if you just look at the, the middle three lanes where they're marked wild type, that's wild type DNMT5. Uh, uh, that's been brought together through a, a sexual cross with the unmethylated centromere. And you can see that the unmethylated centromere in these three seconds stays unmethylated. So, so passage through meiosis is not sufficient to efficiently restore um, methylation. So the in vivo experiment suggests that DNMT5 is a maintenance methylase, right? Once you get rid of methylation, it doesn't come back even if you bring put the enzyme together with the uh, DNA. Um, and so is it? So to ask this question, uh, and to answer this question, we expressed and purified full-length DNMT5. We're able to do this in cerevisiae. Uh, more recently, we've been able to do this in insect cells for structural studies that are underway. Um, but, but at the time, we had cerevisiae, and you can see that we can purify it to current homogeneity. And then when we mix this protein with oligonucleotides uh, that are either unmethylated, hemimethylated uh, on the Watson or Crick strands, or uh, fully methylated, and if we uh, uh, add uh, tritiated s methionine and do standard methyl transferase uh, assays, uh, you can see that uh, regardless of the substrate, nothing happens unless we add ATP. And if you add ATP, uh, we now see nice uh, activity, uh, but only with hemimethylated substrates. We see absolutely no uh, activity with unmethylated substrates. Uh, and so if you do the enzymology here, we can say that this is uh, the uh, most uh, hemimethyl specific DNA methyl transferase uh, ever described. It has just amazing, exquisite uh, specificity. And it also has um, this absolute requirement for ATP, uh, which we now know is a requirement for ATP hydrolysis, not merely binding. 
Uh, and again, we're doing a lot of uh, structural work now to um, understand how this all works. So uh, the switch SNP ATPase here is not doing chromatin remodeling, it's doing enzymology. Uh, the, the substrate specificity is it's pretty extreme. We cannot, even if we do endpoint assays, what you're seeing here is uh, incorporation of um, uh, radioactive, uh, the methyl group from radioactive SAM into DNA. And uh, on this log scale, we have at least three orders of magnitude signal above background uh, in, for hemimethylated substrate, and zero signal above background for non-methylated substrate. So it's an exquisitely specific uh, maintenance uh, enzyme. Uh, both in vivo and in vitro. So then the big question is, how is methylation ever established in a species with a maintenance only paradigm? And so uh, to address this question, I took advantage of the fact that um, mycologists have been studying various fungi from various uh, phyla for, for years. And now in the era of ge uh, genomics, we have lots and lots of short read genome sequences. And so I got in touch with Christina Cuomo at Broad Institute, who's a leader in this area. And just asked her uh, over the phone, um, or maybe it was Skype, I don't remember, um, uh, what was going on with the evolution of um, DNA, cytosine DNA methyltransferases um, in cryptococcus and related species. And I knew she had a bunch of genomes at this point in time. Um, and so she asked me what was the PFAM number for the domain, which I had to look up and give it to her. And then uh, she, on the fly, uh, looking at her monitor, said that, well, uh, Cryptococcus and uh, the related species Cryptococcus gadii, which is also a human pathogen, just has one cytosine methyltransferase that looks like yours, DNMT5. Uh, Cryptococcus deuterogadii, which I told you about already that had lost uh, DNA methylation, uh, is missing it. Uh, and then there's um, species that are a little further out that are not pathogens, Cryptococcus amylolentis and Cryptococcus infieldii, that again, just have one predicted cytosine DNA methyltransferase. Uh, Cryptococcus de paparatus, uh, again, seems to be another lost event. We, we don't understand that. And then she said, well, if you look further out in uh, phylogeny uh, at species that you know, diverged a, a, a lot further back from Cryptococcus neoformans, uh, what you can see is that they all have DNMP5, your enzyme, but then they have a second putative cytosine DNA methyltransferase that we named DNMTX uh, because it was uh, quite mysterious at the time. Uh, and what you can see by looking at this phylogeny is that the DNMTX gene was lost on this branch of evolution. And, um, uh, and then subsequently in some of these lineages, Deuterogadii and Depoparatus, uh, DNMT5 was lost subsequent to DNMTX. Uh, so we hypothesized that perhaps DNMTX was a de novo enzyme and that um, uh, and then it was lost. And then that lineage has been relying on this maintenance enzyme ever since. And so to test that, uh, we got the species that had DNMTX from a repository in the Netherlands, 100 euros per strain. Uh, took a while to get them. Uh, but then we were able to amplify the DNMTX genes from those organisms, put them behind the GAL promoter, stick them into Cryptococcus, and we put them into the, the Rhode Island strain, rather the reintroduction strain, uh, that. Um, uh, again, um, doesn't have methylation to speak of, but is ready to accept de novo methylation and maintain it once it arrives. And so we did this with three different uh, uh, DNMTXs as shown here. So this is a centromere 9, um, and the top two tracks are either uh, methylation DNA and immunoprecipitation sequencing, MEDIP-seq, or bisulfite sequencing, uh, showing no methylation in the reintroduced uh, strain. Uh, and then in the next uh, six tracks are what happens when you introduce DNMTX from either uh, Cryptococcus uh, pinus, from a pine tree, Quaniella mangrovensis, or Cryptococcus bestiole. And you can see in, in all of these cases, you now see methylation appearing uh, de novo. Uh, if you look at all the chromosomes, it's, uh, it's spotty. Some centromeres acquire it more quickly than others. Um, some telomeres acquire it, but it's clear that methylation appears uh, de novo when you express DNMTX in this uh, strain. So that argues that uh, DNMTX is a de novo enzyme and it was lost during the evolution of the lineage that gave rise to Cryptococcus neoformans. So when did this happen? So if you look at uh, uh, estimates for divergence times in these trees, uh, uh, this event seemed to have happened uh, roughly between 50 and 150 million years ago. 
Uh, so this is a uh, plot of biodiversity during the Phenerozoic. Uh, and you can see um, by the upside down uh, yellow triangles, all the extinction events that have happened. And the last one happened uh, uh, between what, 50 and 60 million years ago. And that was when uh, the Cretaceous uh, ended. Uh, so this uh, period of time where we think the NMT axis loss is uh, largely overlapping with the Cretaceous, which is of course when dinosaurs uh, roam the earth. This is a picture I took in the Natural History Museum in uh, New York City of uh, uh, a late Cretaceous dinosaur. So the dinosaurs didn't uh, make it, but Cryptococcus did, despite not having DNMTX. And again, it's been maintaining uh, methylation somehow uh, until the present day. And shown on the bottom, of course, is what our ancestors looked like uh, back then. And so it's been a while. We've changed, hopefully. Okay, so Cryptococcus uh, uh, has maintained it. Uh, how? How is this lineage maintained 5-methyl-C after the ancient loss of DNMTX? So we've done um, a couple classes of experiments um, to uh, address this uh, question. The first was laboratory evolution experiments. So here what we did was to take a culture of Cryptococcus, just wild type, take a little bit of it out, carefully measure methylation by bisulfite sequencing, and then propagate the strains without bottlenecking for uh, a good number of generations. So in this case, it's 120 generations. And then we took two colonies, so we plated out the culture for singles, single colonies, uh, so that we did bottleneck. And then we grew up the two colonies just enough to do whole genome bisulfite sequencing. And this was done in a quite painstaking way. We did everything uh, very carefully in replicate. We've become, uh, better at bisulfite sequencing than uh, I ever thought we needed to. Um, and we asked whether there was um, loss of methylation in the laboratory, where we don't think there's much um, selection. The knockout mutants seem to grow pretty well. Um, or whether we saw random uh, what gain events and whether these losses and gains were, were random. So uh, what's shown here are bisulfite sequencing tracks of the parent and two colonies. Uh, on the top is uh, an example of a loss event where you can see in colony two, uh, a CG that's methylated in uh, wild type and in colony one is no longer methylated in colony two. And for all of these things, we actually you know, look at the actual reads. Uh, so we're quite confident in our filters and analysis uh, for, for this type of data. Um, on the bottom is a, a rarer event, which is a gain event, where again, you can see that in the uh, parent, um, um, there isn't CG methylation at this site, um, and we have good coverage, of course. Um, we're, not, we're not showing regions where we don't have coverage um, or mapping. Um, and then in colony one, um, it appears. It's not in colony two. That's a rare gain event. So when all the dust settles, here's the analysis of the two colonies. Um, so in the big picture is that after 120 generations, 99% of the sites are, are maintained. Uh, and that corresponds roughly to a, um, a maintenance, you know, a, a, a fidelity, uh, a replication fidelity um, uh, uh, or epi mutation rate of uh, 10 to the minus fourth per generation per site, which is not nearly as good as DNA replication, but not bad for an epigenetic mechanism. Uh, what you can see is we saw 39 loss events in the first colony, uh, 50 in the second, and then five gain events. So the, if you do, again, the math, it uh, turns out that the, 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 the loss, the rate of loss is about 20-fold uh, higher than the rate of gain, which means the system is not in equilibrium. Uh, and so over time, without natural selection or some other mechanism, uh, you would lose uh, cytosine methylation in the system. And that's a strong argument that natural selection is required to maintain the steady state uh, levels of methylation. Uh, we don't see, that, as far as we can see by eye, uh, the, the, the losses and gains seem random. There's no more um, overlap between the sites of loss, of, of, of loss than you'd expect by chance. Uh, and there's no overlap uh, in the two, uh, in the sites of um, gain. So there's five in one, five in the other, but they're completely different. Uh, so this, this seems to be random variation. So the second class of experiments we did, which took a lot longer than we expected, uh, was uh, uh, to look at natural evolution of cytosine methylation, which to our knowledge has never been done before, and probably for good reason, as you'll see. Uh, so uh, what we decided to do is take um, eight strains of Cryptococcus uh, and our uh, 
clade is called Cryptococcus bargrubii. Uh, there are hundreds of Illumina genome sequences because it's a human pathogen. And people have collected a lot of them and are studying them. Uh, they fall in four major clades, and so there's a reference strain called H99, and then we uh, obtained uh, eight um, uh, isolates. Uh, I think some of these are clinical, some are environmental from these different clades. They had a common ancestor about five million years ago. And we asked, uh, are methylation patterns conserved above a chance expectation, and do full-length retrotransposons display higher levels of methylation than other centromeric sequences? Uh, so the next slide. Uh, shows what we did, which is complicated because we had to assemble uh, these genomes with long read sequencing because Illumina sequencing doesn't assemble the centromeres, which again are retrotransposons and their um, remnants. Um, and then we have to do a whole genome by sulfite sequencing on all of these. And we also used the, nanom the nanopore platform to make methylation calls, uh, which uh, helped us uh, fill in some of the regions that short read sequencing misses. So on the left, again, I won't go through this in detail, is the, um, what we did by nanopore and, and uh, 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 well, actually it's whole genome bisulfite. Uh, in the middle is the, the nanopore genome assembly. Uh, and we did two things with that genome assembly, actually three things uh, with nanopore. Um, one was assemble the genome and align centromeres. We couldn't do multiple alignments of centromeres because they're repetitive and with all the inversions uh, and deletions um, and duplications, uh, multiple sequence alignment is just not possible. So we did pairwise alignments of the regions we could align um, and for which we had bisulfite coverage and we looked at conservation. Uh, we also uh, identified manually what we think are likely full length retrotransposons with two LTRs. We um, um, aligned them and also used the combination then of bisulfite and uh, nanopore uh, calls um, to look at conservation um, and enrichment at transposons. Okay, so again, the questions are, are methylation patterns conserved above a chance expectations and do full length retrotransposons have higher levels of methylation than uh, other sequences in the centromere? Um, so, whoops, I think I went backwards. Okay. And going forwards, this, up, back up. This is a uh, I'm going to show you a circos plot. Uh, so what we do is pairwise alignment. So what's shown on the outer ring, uh, this is a particular centromere, centromere four for these isolates. The inner ring is where we could align pairwise uh, these uh, this sequences from these centromeres. And then the colors indicate whether uh, we've only colored it, uh, colored lines show where there's methylation in one or both of um, the alignments. And, and of course we have to have coverage. And so when you do this analysis, it's complicated because a given uh, uh, region of a center might align with uh, uh, up to um, seven other strains. Um, and so we have to uh, classify uh, the alignments based on that. In any case, uh, what you can see here um, is um, um, the uh, expected and observed amounts of sharing of cytosine methylation between these alignable regions. And um, the ends refer to um, up to eight strains in which we can um, identify a sequence. So for example, N equals six, you can see that for um, alignments that um, Centromeric uh, um, regions that align to um, five strains and the original strain, um, we see much more uh, sharing of methylation than you'd expect by chance. So there's conservation of or, or sharing of methylation um, above chance expectation, as you'd expect from natural selection. We also um, looked at um, the fraction of methylation in the annotated transposons I mentioned versus the other sequences. And for all of these strains, you can see that there's more fractional methylation at the transposable elements than at the um, non-putative uh, uh, full-length um, elements, which again is consistent with natural selection. Um, this is um, the final data slide. Uh, so there'll be time for questions, good. Um, and um, this is uh, one particular family that shows particularly high levels of methylation. So uh, the rows are individual instances of a transposon across these eight strains. And the color code uh, is basically, if it's white, it's unalignable, an unmethylated CG is, uh, is yellow, and then in the blues are the methylated uh, CGs. 
across the top, you can see across these instances what fraction are methylated at a given site. And you can see it can be quite high. Um, and then on the right um, is the 5 methylcytosine density in each instance. And again, you can see that for some of these transposons, virtually all of the CGs are uh, methylated. So we think that this TCN3, uh, again, gypsy uh, family member, uh, might be um, a particularly important biological target of the system uh, to silence. Okay, so the question, uh, can an epigenetic mark mediate the evolution of traits? Well, what I've shown you is inheritance of 5-methyl-C by this uh, remarkable ATP-dependent cytosine methyltransferase, CNMT5. Natural variation, loss and gains of 5-methyl-C, uh, particularly a lot of loss and a rare amount of gain. Uh, and then uh, evidence, uh, multiple lines of evidence, both from laboratory evolution and natural selection uh, uh, or, or natural evolution for um, uh, natural selection operating on these elements. And this work was uh, recently uh, published in the references here. So I didn't do any of this work. Uh, the most important slide is here. Uh, the entire project was coordinated and everything, all the in vivo work was done by Sandra Catania, a uh, very talented postdoc originally from Robin Allshire's lab who's on the job market this year. Philip Domestic is a former MD PhD student who did all the biochemistry while he was uh, bored finishing up medical school uh, as, a, as an MD PhD student and would hang out in the lab and uh, did the biochemistry up with his friend in Gita Narlicker's lab upstairs, Caitlin Stoddard, who was studying a different methyl transferase in, uh, from Arabidopsis. Christina Cuomo and her team did the nanopore sequencing and genome assembly. Harold Pimentel is an amazing postdoctoral fellow in uh, Johnson Pritchard's lab who did the uh, analysis of the natural uh, and, uh, laboratory evolution. Petra Hajkova and Amar Nassif in her lab did the animal sensitivity uh, mass spec. John Yates uh, has been our longtime mass spec collaborator. I didn't uh, have a for protein mass spec. I didn't have a chance to tell you about uh, the work we did with him. And uh, we're uh, quite far along with structural studies with uh, Dinshaw uh, Patel, uh, but we have some more work to do. And Dinshaw didn't want me to show structure, so I won't. <laughs> uh, and of course, I uh, need to thank our, our many funding uh, agencies. And uh, this is a photo the lab sent uh, last Halloween uh, while I was on the road. I guess it was a dress up day. Not sure what's going on with some of these costumes. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, stop there and I'd be happy to answer questions if people are still here. I can't actually tell on my screen. Oh, it says 80 participants. Pretty good. Thank you so much, Aiden. That was a great talk. And yeah, more than 80 participants throughout. So I think that was a fantastic way to start off hopefully this new series. Um, I was curious if you could comment more. Oh, by the way, if people have questions, like this is a good time to start typing them into the Q&A. Um, but I was wondering if you could comment more about the ATPA since like it's in a switch NIF domain, but it's not remodeling. And I, you mentioned it's very unusual for a DNTP to have an ATPA domain. Um, could you say more? Like, do you know anything else? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we know more. It's largely coming from st structural work. But actually, we have a paper um, that we, we put out on BioArchive that's enzymology um, from Philip. That's under review. Um, so here's what we know. Uh, we know that um, uh, the ATPase is stimulated by uh, hemimethylated DNA, uh, eightfold more than unmethylated or methylated DNA. So it appears that the TNMT domain, when it binds a uh, substrate, does something uh, to activate the ATPase domain. And then we know that ATP hydrolysis is absolutely required for DNA methylation. So that argues that the conformational change that happens upon ATP binding, uh, hydrolysis, or perhaps phosphate release activates the conformation of the DNA methyltransferase uh, domain to activate um, the enzyme. Um, and um, we have, again, evidence from the, um, the, the enzymology that um, part of this process is connected to uh, flipping out the base. Um, which, as, as you probably know, DNA methyltransferase, as originally seen for HHA1, um, actually flipped the base out of the double helix, which had never been seen before, and this is in the early 90s, uh, into the active site. Um, and so that's, there's an energetic cost to that. Um, and so what 
binding to the enzyme has to do is um, compensate for that energetic cost by inserting protein elements into the helix that um, facilitate um, uh, that moving out. Um, but the, the, the details of, of how the ATPase, all these conformational changes work, will have to uh, await completion of these structures and subsequent uh, mutational analysis, which is underway. Okay, um, let's see. There's a bunch of questions already in Q&A. Um, so the first one is whether the mechanism of spontaneous 5-methyl C, um, whether, the uh, whether the mechanism of the spontaneous uh, methylation is known, do you no. suspect that given enough generation spontaneous 5-methyl C in the RI, the NMT5 would recapitulate wild type 5-methyl C? Yeah, synthetic? good questions, yeah. So, um, to, to the first point, we don't know. Uh, it could either be extremely low level methylation by DNMT5 itself, no enzymes perfect, uh, and it only needs to happen once and then it gets maintained efficiently. It could also be some other methyl transferase in the cell, like a TNR, tRNA 5-methyl C methyl transferase, or it could even be gene conversion between repeated sequences. So you could imagine that if you have a methylated sequence and a homologous unmethylated sequence, during double strand break repair, you form heteroduplex, and maybe that heteroduplex could then be a substrate for DNMT5. Um, so some of those are more easily testable than others. Um, we have um, propagated the reintroduced strain uh, very crudely, just for months uh, on the bench by streaking it out and then doing bisulfite sequencing, and we, we do see it uh, go up. Uh, it doesn't get in months to wild type. Um, but um, maybe it would if we uh, did the experiment for uh, a decade. But I don't think we're going to do that experiment. Sorry, I'm still getting used to Zoom. So I wanted to just say thanks, Alex, for that question. Um, he's actually a grad student in Karen's lab, so I know him. Um, the next question is from James Gahan, or Gahan. Um, he's asking, what is the recruitment mechanism of DNMTX? Ah, the DNMTX is interesting. So we don't know what the recruitment mechanism for DNMTX. It has a BAH domain, probably two BAH domains, and we're uh, initiating structural studies to, to get at that. Um, the species that have DNMTX, we think are gonna be very tractable. They grow fine in the lab, they're haploid, they're even mating pairs available. And I think with CRISPR and Cas9, which works well in Cryptococcus, uh, we shouldn't have uh, too much trouble um, getting those systems up and running. Uh, one thing I'll say that's interesting is that we've looked at the list of genes that are that were lost uh, along with DNMTX, thinking they might be involved in DNA methylation. Um, and one of them actually is conserved in humans and is mutated in a human disease characterized by a defect in de novo methylation called ICF syndrome. So that's a hint that perhaps the mechanisms of de novo methylation might be um, much more conserved than people uh, suspect. Cool. So um, the next question is from Somnath Paul, and he asks, does the ATPase domain help in recruiting it to the DNA on the nucleosome? So, um, so far, we have seen no effect. So we've actually done DNA up in Gita's lab with Caitlin. Uh, okay. Philip did uh, assays with um, modified nucleosomes, peptides, etc. We've seen no effect so far of, of nucleosomes in terms of enhancing uh, the reaction. And we think based on sequence gazing that the ATPase probably doesn't bind DNA, uh, unlike switch SNP. Um, so we think that coupling of the motions, you know, that you expect between the RecA domains of these superfamily two ATPases is, is, is not uh, directly coupled like the ATPase itself to um, DNA binding. I think it's more uh, uh, talking to the DNA methyl transferase, both in terms of the substrate stimulating ATPase and then hydrolysis stimulating the enzyme. Awesome. So, okay, I'm just going to take a minute here to say that there are a lot of questions, which is great. <laughs> um, so, I think maybe the best plan is to just keep answering some of them and then what we can do is um copy and paste them over to the discord's channel and maybe whenever you have oh, time 
to answer. That would be, that would be great because I have a 10 o'clock lab meeting at 10 here. Okay, <laughs> three well, minutes. we'll take one more question okay. then, if that's okay. Um, sure. And the next one is from Sheila Tevis, and she asks, what's the maintenance rate for other species that have both maintenance and de novo DM, DNMTS? Is it much lower than for neoformans? Um, good question. You mean other, uh, if you mean other fungal species, like in this little group of organisms, we haven't measured it. In fact, we haven't measured the true rate in Cryptococcus for that you need to do fluctuation analysis. Um, so our, our measurements are, you know, are a bit on the crude side, I'd say. Um, um, and so we don't know uh, in the, the other related species. Um, and in, in mammals, I don't know either because there's demethylation. So it seems like it's hard to know what the actual rate is uh, when you have um, de novo around and demethylation happening through the tets. We don't have tets, by the way. Okay, great. Right. Um, I think we have to leave it at that then and we'll copy over the remaining questions to the Discord channel. Um, thank you so all much right. for your talk and sure. thank you for the audience for the participation. Thank you very much. Congrats, congrats on getting the fragile nucleosome set up. Let's, let's hope it stays, uh, stays strong. Yeah, I will make some more announcements to make things more, um, what's the word, like official to keep things going. So thanks so much. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.